everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all to the workshop, Working with Women and Girls, Gender Responsive Treatment Strategies and Corrections. Very excited that you all could join us today. My name is Katie Garrett. I'm the Project Associate at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Uh, we know that throughout the conference, we've been talking a lot about um, women and girls, hopefully in some of your other sessions, but this is really sort of one of the only sessions that's mainly focused on women and girls. So very excited that you all are here today to talk about this extremely important population. We have a great panel today. I don't want to take up too much of your time as we have so much expertise up here and, and really excited to hear everyone's presentations. We're first going to hear from Maureen Buell, who's a Correctional Program Specialist at the National Institute of Corrections. Uh, Maureen is going to go ahead and, and talk about some of the evidence-based research around um, women. Uh, following her, we're going to have Warden Shalif Hansbrough at the Decatur Correctional Facility from the Illinois Department of Corrections. And then following her presentation, we're going to have Erica Millette, who's a Program Administrator in the Offender Reentry Division for the City of Dallas in Texas. And she works with Stacy Burns, who's the clinical director at the Nexus Recovery Center, Incorporated. And following their presentations, we're going to hear from Lisa Fries, who's a consultant, the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency and Prevention at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. So really excited to have you all here today and our panelists as well, and looking forward to a rich discussion. And with that, we're going to go ahead and start with Maureen. Good afternoon. Um, the good news is I don't have PowerPoints. And uh, it, it's good news for you, believe me, it is. And uh, first of all, this picture right here, I'm actually from Vermont, and I'm pretty sure that this picture is of Vermont. So this is the only PowerPoint that I have. Um, uh, just a little bit about the National Institute of Corrections for folks who aren't familiar with us. We're part of the Department of Justice, and we're actually located within the Bureau of Prisons. We're a very small organization. We're about 60 staff. And we have offices both here in Washington, D.C., and then we have a training academy uh, in Aurora, Colorado. And uh, NIC was actually formed um, through legislation in 1974 as a result of the riots um, at the Attica State Prison in New York. And for folks, uh, many folks, I'm looking around the room here, probably weren't born um, when that occurred, but um, uh, uh, over 30 individuals were killed in that uprising, um, correctional officers, law enforcement personnel, as well as inmates. And so they're, they're, uh, we were created as uh, specifically to provide training and assistance to prisons, jails, community corrections across the country um, on all manner of criminal justice issues. So um, we have a number of divisions. We have prisons division, jails division, community corrections, a research division. Um, my particular um, bit of work uh, with the women offenders kind of crosses all of those divisions. Um, women really do move through all of those um, various parts of the continuum. So what I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about the research and um, talk a little bit about some of the resources out there, which I think is important if we're going to talk about the issue. It's nice to know that there's something that you can look at um, that might help you in working with this population. Uh, how many folks in here actually um, do work with women offenders in some fashion? Oh, fabulous. This is great. My background actually is um, primarily in community corrections, and I can remember as a probation and parole officer um, begging to have 10 men um, in lieu of one woman to work with because <laughs> women were so challenging to work with. And it didn't occur to me until some years uh, down the road that one of the reasons why they were so challenging to work with was one, because they have some different needs and some different issues. Also because our systems really have not been created to work with that population. So much of what we do in criminal justice works well for women. Much of what we do, we can improve upon. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. And I did this presentation. Um, I had three days to do it in last week. I had three hours to do it in yesterday. So I'm going to get this done in about 12 minutes today. And um, so watch me. So the one thing that I will tell you, and you may have heard this throughout the conference, is that the women offender population has been a very fast-growing population. Um, the uh, 2010 data from BJS said that um, arrests for women offenders increased 15.4% over the last decade and decreased 5% for male offenders. 
Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of folks will say, well, women are more violent. Well, it's really not true. Um, women are being arrested more for violence. And if you look at the data, a lot of that violence is actually uh, simple assault. Um, it's misdemeanor violence, but it is violence just the same. But the really, the, the big piece of news has been um, around uh, drug use. And the majority of women that are being housed in, in our prisons and jails are for um, drug-related offenses and property-related offenses. So it, we're, I haven't been attending the conference because I just came in from another conference this morning, but um, one of the things I think is really critical for this work has been the evidence-based practices. Um, that has done, I think that's done a significant amount for criminal justice. It's professionalized our staff. It's given us a foundation from which to build our, our practices and our policies. Um, it's forcing us to look at and measure what we're doing. Is it actually working? Um, and how we're we using our resources. So, you know, we've, we've talked about the big four, antisocial behavior, antisocial personalities, criminal behavior, criminal associates. We've talked about the big eight. You add um, family dysfunction, leisure time, um, uh, education, employment, and substance abuse to that. And it works with women. It is effective with women, but it's not the whole story. And what's really, really emerged in the past 10, 12 years really has been research specific to women offenders. And much of what we're identifying is that the evidence-based practices do work for women, but we can sharpen our practice with this population and really improve our outcomes. And so, um, you know, for folks who've worked with women, oftentimes, and I've heard this before, that um, there's a belief that, well, if you're working with women offenders, it's not real corrections, or if you're working with women offenders, you know, it, it's, you're working with a sort of boutique population, and you're not holding women accountable. That's not what this work is about. It's really about improving outcomes, both with the individual woman and also system outcomes. We are spending a lot of money on a lot of hard beds for lower risk women, and I think that's important. Um, I think one of the ahas for me was that a lot of the policies, practices, procedures that we develop in criminal justice, we develop primarily for the largest population, and that has been for male offenders. And then what we've done is we've taken those policies, practices, procedures, tools, assessment tools, um, whatever, and then we apply them to women. They are valid, but again, we're not catching the whole picture. When you think about the anti, when you think about the, the big four and the big eight, what we're not talking about is the importance of trauma with this population, which is huge. Um, we're not talking about the fact that women get into the criminal justice system a little bit different than their male counterparts, and there is research out there to um, support that. And I will be the first one to tell you that there is not a huge body of research, big empirical randomized studies on women offenders. There's a lot of uh, narrative research. There's a lot of qualitative research. There is some quantitative research, but there's not the big body of work that you do often see with the male offenders. Um, because the numbers are smaller, you have to have somebody who will invest the money in that kind of research. But everything that we're seeing points in the same direction, that women come into criminal justice differently, their experiences um, when they're incarcerated is very different, and what happens is we prepare them for reentry and supervision in the community is different than their male offenders. So what are some of the things that are different? Certainly, uh, the issues around sexual and physical abuse with women and with girls is significantly different. We know that men and boys have been victims of child sexual abuse. We do know that. Um, but what we also know is that that abuse usually levels off when males begin to reach adolescence. And it continues to increase with girls and women, with date rape, with sexual assault, with domestic violence. Um, and so that, that's a big factor. And when you look at the populations in correctional facilities of women who have uh, co-occurring disorders, significant mental health issues, the use of psychotropics with women offenders, it's huge. So it's really something that we need to pay attention to. But our practices really don't look at those issues. I think another important area is the significance of children. 
Um, the majority of women who go into our uh, correctional system are parents of, let me move back a little bit here, parents of um, minor age children. And oftentimes when they get out of prison, they will assume responsibility for those children. And that has implications. It's a little bit different than men. Now we know that some men do also have responsibility for their children and do want to be good parents, and I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, I like to say that a lot of what we know about and we're learning about women offenders, I think, has applicability to men. Um, I think men do want to be good parents. I think that men are struggling with issues around trauma as well. So I think that we really have some information that we can share. But when you talk about supervising women in the community, when you talk about the resources that you need um, to be sure that they have access to, um, it, it's a bit more oftentimes than their male counterparts. So when a woman goes out in the community, we have to think about not only her meeting her conditions of probation and parole, paying restitution, getting to treatment, um, substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, getting to any kind of groups, uh, reporting to her probation parole officer, I think I said that. Um, but what we're not talking about is, in order to do all that, she's got to be sure that there is a safe place for her and her children, that the environment she's living with uh, does not have domestic violence in it or any kind of violence in it, that the roof isn't caving down around their heads. She still has to be able to clothe the kids, feed the kids, get the kids to school, be sure that somebody's watching the children when she goes to meet with her probation officer or her treatment provider, who may be way on the other side of town and she doesn't have access to transportation. So I mention these things, not that we need to let the women off the hook, but we need to pay attention to this as we're creating um, our reentry programs and as we work with our probation and parole officers who are supervising these women in the community to take those things into consideration. And there are pockets around the country that are doing a great job with this kind of information. Um, let's see, uh, other issues, uh, poverty, huge issue with women offenders, lack of employment histories. Um, the poverty issue is critical, particularly if women have their children with them. Um, and we look at the numbers of women, single uh, head of household, that are living in poverty, and certainly that's the case with, um, with the women offenders that we work with. Um, some of the federal policies and legislation has had um, uh, some fairly dire consequences with women offenders. Um, certainly some of those issues around um, TANF, around access to benefits, um, food stamps. Now we know that some states individually are making some differences in, in changing their legislation. Um, if you look at the Mythbusters, I think that's one of the Mythbusters that it talks about that issue. So that's great for the states that are doing that. Um, but that puts an additional burden on, on the women for sure. And you know, we spend a lot of time in criminal justice. We just look at the um, deficits and the risk with the populations we work with. So what we've really been trying to do in the work with the women offenders is really look at strengths and resiliency. How can we work with the women to identify with them internally what their strengths are and what strengths they might have um, in a community setting? And um, there have been some organizations, Family Justice, for example, um, which is now they've turned their work over to Vera. They have done significant work around identifying strengths in community settings with offender populations. So there's a lot of resources out there, um, but we just need to be able to tap them. But this is a different population. Uh, it's interesting when uh, you look at the data when women return to prison. By and large, they're not returning for new offenses. They're returning for violations of probation and parole. They're returning because they're not meeting with their probation officer, they're failing drug tests, um, they uh, are not completing treatment. And when you look at some of the treatment that's out there for women offenders, co-ed groups, well, a woman who has trauma in her background is not gonna sit and talk honestly about that if there are men in that group. Uh, the data also says that women have um, worse outcomes if they don't complete substance abuse treatment. So not only do you have to have treatment that's focused on this population, but you've got to have programs that will actually get the women there um, and speaks to them and really speaks to the issues that they bring. How am I doing? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, great. 
Um, so, you know, I was looking at the, um, at the agenda for this conference, and I saw that there is just a wealth of information that's relevant to this population. Um, certainly the work that um, Joan Galise um, has been doing with the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care, that has huge implications for win women offender populations, huge implications for how you create policy and practice and train staff. Um, uh, organizations that are using trauma-informed practices um, will see a reduction in disciplinary reports, uses of force. I mean, that stuff's significant. That's huge. Um, victims' work. I know that there was a workshop on working with um, uh, victims of crime. One of the things I like to tell people is that so many of the women that we work with themselves are victims. And there has been kind of a struggle uh, over the years in the, um, the advocacy world around the importance of working with women who also are convicted of, of crimes because so many of these women themselves bring their own histories of victimization. So I'm really heartened by the fact that I'm talking to people around the country who are seeing this and are being able to change, make some changes to their funding streams to be able to actually work within um, criminal justice settings um, with women offenders who are also themselves um, victims of um, violent crime. Mentoring. Um, jurisdictions that have been using mentoring for women offenders have found that they're staying in the community longer because they're making non-correctional kinds of connections. They're actually becoming more a part of their community um, as opposed to, you know, the only um, sort of supportive resource they have are criminal justice kinds of groups. So it's lovely when you see people actually doing things that are not necessarily related to being an offender. Uh, let's see here. So uh, just in closing, a couple quick things. Um, I'm going to, I don't have PowerPoints as I said today. However, I will post this information. It'll be a little bit longer version, but I will put it on the uh, website for this conference. And I want to just tell you, if you want to jot down a couple of websites. Um, first of all, um, I would encourage you to look at our website from the National Institute of Corrections. Um, and I'll direct you to our Women Offender page. So it's uh, www.nicic.gov forward slash women offenders. Uh, another resource I want to direct you to is the um, National Resource Center on Justice Involved Women. And that actually is a BJA funded uh, project and um, it is uh, they are collecting information from all over the place on what works with women offenders and um, we're working closely with them NIC and they've got just a number of, of great things on that website and that website is the triple W's CJ involved women dot org they have a coaching packet around reentry for women. They have a paper called 10 Truths in Working with Women Offenders. They've got some, some great stuff. Um, also look at um, the Women's Risk Need Assessment. Uh, NIC, in collaboration with the University of Cincinnati, uh, actually created a series of women's risk need tools that have been validated entirely on a population of women. They're being used across the country. They have application to probation and parole, to pre-release. And the beauty of these tools is that it really speaks to the significance of trauma, substance abuse, parenting issues. And we're finding that in the construction validation research that, surprise, surprise, women's needs are contributing to their risk. So when you talk about criminal associates, a male offender, oftentimes, it's his buddy on the corner. With a woman, oftentimes, it's her partner, her intimate partner. So again, not that we ignore that information, but that we deal with it in a more effective way. Um, so the website, um, which has research on the development of the women's risk need tools, and it's just chock full of other information, is www.uc. Dot edu forward slash women offenders. Um, 
Two other quick things. One is that the um, Federal Interagency Reentry Council, which um, uh, is doing some amazing work and is really pretty far reaching, I am happy to say that there is um, a subgroup in there uh, focusing on women offender issues. And we're just uh, getting up and running, but um, uh, in 2013, I think that you'll see and hear a lot about um, reentry issues for women offenders. And let's see, lastly, um, I want to just note the work that SAMHSA has been doing around trauma, again, the National Center for Trauma Informed Care, and also uh, around women's health issues, the Office of Women's Health through uh, Health and Human Services. You know, as we develop our, our projects and our initiatives for the field at NIC, we not only look internally at criminal justice, but we also just reach outside for who's doing what around mental health, substance abuse, parenting, trauma. So there's a lot of information out there. We're trying to pull it together to make it easier to get to, but we're really also trying to focus on what works, what's evidence-based, what should we stop doing, do less of, start doing, do more of. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Shalee Pansbro. I'm the warden at Decatur Correctional Center. It's a minimum security facility in Decatur, Illinois, which is central Illinois for some of you. How many know where Decatur is? Okay, I got, okay, a few people in the room. Well, again, it is a minimum security facility, and we do focus on, first of all, I have about 700 women that are in my prison, and 85% of those women are mothers. And so when you think about what that means for families that have been broken and children that have been left in the care of, hopefully, if they're lucky, family members that care for them, but so many other times, these children end up in the... Um, foster care system and so and so many other um, issues that arise as a result of that. Well, we really try and focus on, again, the mothers and their bonds with their children. And I actually have a prison-based nursery program that I'd like to talk to you about. So, I have some brochures here that I'll pass out a little bit later. Excuse me, Maureen. Mm -hmm. I meant to grab this a few moments ago. So what I will do is just kind of, I have a couple of photo albums. I don't know if I can get that over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Just touch those around. Again, it's been about five years that we've had this, this program at Decatur Correctional Center. Now I told you I have about 700 women at my facility and 85% of them are mothers. And there's no way in the world that I could have all of their children in the prison. Um, in terms of my moms and babies program, I have currently nine mothers, one who is expecting, and eight babies that are in the facility. They live there, they're able to stay there for up to 24 months. Once they reach the age of 24 months, and of course they have to either um, be on their way to a women's treatment center or the mother should be on her way to mandatory supervised release. And so right now we are proud to be able to say that in the five years of existence of this program that we have 0% recidivism. We have had 44 mothers and 39 babies that have gone through this program since 2007. If you look at those photos, when director at that time it was Director Roger Walker who approved this program, he said he wanted to be able to open up a photo album and not be able to tell that the child was in prison. And I hope that as you're looking through there, you cannot tell because we chronicle these children's lives because of course, they want to be able to, just as our children have been able to do, look back in a photo album and see you know, where they were, photos of themselves when they were infants. And so we make sure that we do that. We've been spending a lot of time on focusing the, on the bond between the mothers and the children. And we do believe that is what has kept them from returning to prison, those that we've been able to work with. But we, over the last six months or so, we really felt that we really needed to focus also, not that we had not focused on it, but we really needed to pay particular attention to their criminogenic history. What actually brought them to prison in the first place? And for the most part, it has been 
drug-related crimes. That's what ends them up at my facility. And so while, of course, we present them with drug treatment, we were also presenting them with parenting opportunities and assisting with their, with their children. Now, let me just back up a little bit. My mom and babies program has a 0% budget. We have no money in our facility budget for the babies. But what we have been able to do is work with the community. Those support systems that the mothers would have been able to apply for, those types of public assistance programs, WIC and things like that, they're able to apply for those programs and Department of Human Services also, they assist us with actually caring for the baby. We only have funding to care for the mother, but because of those relationships out in the community, we're able to care for the children's needs. And so as we were caring for the children's needs, we again, had to say, okay, so what will keep them from returning to prison long term? This five years has been great. They haven't come back. And so we've been doing a lot internally with them, but as of 2010, we were able to acquire the Second Chance Grant. However, due to new procurement laws, you guys don't know anything about that, but procurement laws, we weren't able to actually start the program right away. We had a number of setbacks just because of new legislation. So recently, at, well, within the last six months, um, January, December and January, we were able to actually hire a family reentry coach who is actually based on the inside because we needed an inside out approach to helping these women be able to focus on their issues and to be productive once they were going to leave the facility. And so um, the reentry coach as well as the family case manager. The family case manager will now be able to assist them on the outside, helping them with whatever their issues are. Um, the reentry coach, first of all, We'll work with all of our participants. Right now we have, again, nine that are in the facility. They conduct intake interviews with them when they first come into the prison, when they're, um, they find out that they're expecting, they've been sent down to our facility, and they determine what their issues are. They not only hold individual sessions, but they work with them within group sessions. They deal with their trauma. They deal with the issues that have brought them to corrections in the first place. And so they're able to do that in several different capacities. Um, some examples of what they're doing, um, criminal thinking, healthy relationships. And so um, there are also monthly staffings that are conducted with these women. They. What we also want them to do is realize, because many of you know, because most of you raised your hands who deal with the women offender, when they go home, people who have taken care of their children are so tired of taking care of those children that when they step out of the door, they are saddled with that responsibility right away. And most of the time, they aren't prepared because they haven't had that opportunity to transition, I'm sorry, to transition back into the community before they have all of this responsibility. And so really just trying to start to work with them, even their fears, talking to them about what their fears are and how to overcome those things. So we develop with them as they're getting ready to leave a discharge plan to assist them with that transition um, to going home because there are so many issues. There's trepidation, many of them sometimes will do things to set themselves back because they're afraid of going home. And so um, we set them up with their initial treatments and their appointments on the outside. We just really try and assist them. Just because we assist them doesn't mean that they don't have any self-accountability because they do. You know, they're going to have to be the ones that are going to have to show up. They're going to have to participate. They're going to have to want it. So as much as we put out there for them to um, be able to access, they have to be able to and, and willing to do that. So before they parole out, they're then transferred over to that family case manager that I talked about. So the family case manager then will, before the offender goes home, the family case manager will meet with their family members. They will also work with family circles, which we, they will bring the family into the facility to have group sessions before they even go home so that they can begin to talk about what's going to be that one thing that could trigger me and I will not be successful when I go out. So they'll do that. They'll 
develop those relationships because as you know, there are so many relationships that are torn and broken and so many family members that don't even want to see them come back. And so that family case manager will assist and really try and um, be able to solidify that family bond once again. They will assist with housing. You know, we were, I was in um, a session yesterday. There are so many myths out there about housing and what types of housing that's accessible to the offender. And we know they have to have housing. They, if they're going to be successful, they need jobs. Any of those things that's going to make that person successful, that's what that family case manager will assist them with. And the treatment has to continue, whether it's drug treatment or mental health treatment. That treatment has to continue once they're on the outside of the facility so that they can be that vital component to their family, their children, so that they can continue on and be able to, be able to successfully be on the outside without the assistance of the family case manager. I talked a little bit about the family circles. That's where the family members will participate in the group therapy sessions inside the facility, but they'll continue those on even when they are on the outside. So those are just some of the things that we are, are really beginning to work on. Again, we weren't able to really focus on the on the second chance grant part of it because we only started in January. So now we're really just trying to determine how successful we are going to be with that. We're very excited about it and we believe that we will be. It's an expansion program. We have had our program going on for, again, as I said, five years, but we really were missing that piece and that was the outside. How can we help them on the outside? Every year we have had a celebration where we've had the women come back We've invited them back with their children just to celebrate um, how well they have been doing. And many of them talk about just how hard it is. It's not as easy as they thought it was going to be because we created this environment to really help them with everything that they needed while they were on the inside. And there was also this sense of entitlement because they were able to keep their children and they were a special population. But once they got outside, they were no longer special. They had to figure out how they were going to make it. And it hasn't been easy. Some of them have talked about still trying to find jobs or trying to retain employment. They may find them, but then they can't keep them because they haven't been equipped with the skills. Some of them have never, ever had to get up to an alarm clock. Those are just things that have happened. And so now we're very excited because we do have this family case manager that will assist them with some basic life skills that we have been able to enjoy most of our lives, quite honestly. And so when we think about that, it can be tragic, but we believe that it's going to be successful for us. Again, we've already experienced success with our 0% recidivism. We believe that bond is also not just going to affect that mother, but we believe by having the parent in the home with them, that is going to help alleviate some of those psychosocial problems or behaviors that may show up in children. And it has been determined that having the parent in the home with the child creates that bond that will hopefully, because we haven't been able to study this for a very long time, hopefully keep that child out of the criminal justice system. I wanted to show you a couple of pictures. How am I doing on time? Okay, one minute, okay. I wanted to show you a couple of pictures um, of our actual unit. In addition to the mom and babies program, we have a family reunification program at my facility where there are about 24 women and they are able to bring their children onto the unit. Uh, someone can bring their child to Decatur Correctional Center an outside caregiver can bring the child there to visit with his or her mother every day of the week. She can help with homework, whatever it is that that child needs because we believe that family reunification is the key. And so they live on this unit as well as the mom and babies. And so I'm just gonna show you um, the mom and babies rooms and that unit so you get an idea that these children don't look like they're in a prison setting at all. It's the mother, the baby, there's a camera that's always on the baby's bed, so we can always monitor the activity. This is the general room where, where um, children are able to come, it's the nursery area. 
Doesn't look like a prison, does it? And that's what we wanted to be, Kara. Be, be sure of and certain of, and that's Annika. And those are all the little handprints of all the children that come in to visit their parents. We have an offender that draws the photos of every baby that comes through our program, and we post them. So with that being said, thank you very much. And I am the Offender Reentry Division Program Administrator for the City of Dallas. Now, most of you may not realize, and I'm not bragging at all, uh, the City of Dallas really contributes to the high recidivism rates in the country. <laughs> <laughs> we also have the Mavericks, the Cowboys, great barbecue, et cetera, and we'd love to have you. Uh, but yeah, we really, we really do. And so what City Hall decided to do was to hire a commercial banker to unify the criminal justice system and the nonprofit organizations and our service providers, our mental health, our substance abuse treatment providers. And I believe they did that, A, because I didn't know what I was getting into, because I hadn't been in that playground for very long. And, uh, and I think they also did so because what's important for the role that they hired me for isn't knowing the issues as much as it is knowing people. And in order to move an entire system that believes uh, that everyone in Texas needs to raise themselves up by their own bootstraps, and everyone, if, you pay, you, uh, if you've done the crime, you pay the time, and when you get out, you'll still be paying that time. Uh, that's a very much ingrained uh, mentality in Texas. And so to have someone come in, you kind of had to have someone come in on blind faith and a whole lot of enthusiasm, which is what I must have radiated during that interview. And, uh, and so what we have been able to accomplish, uh, I believe, is pretty amazing for the last two or three years in just a short period of time. And so what I had to do when I first came in was have hundreds of meetings, uh, closed door meetings, parking lot meetings, bathroom stall meetings. Hey, I hear you over there. What's going on in your program? We need to get together. Cafeteria meetings, you name it. Anytime I could get someone's attention to really be able to connect and help understand what's important to probation, what's important to the correctional facilities, uh, what would make you want to collaborate with others, what are the gaps that you see, and how can we create a solution together to solve them? And so we were able to really create a reentry strategy in Dallas that is reflective not of what I think will work, but literally what every agency and every leader and every case manager and staff members, what they believe will work. And so they have tremendous buy-in into the system that we are creating. And so when the uh, Second Chance Act grants were awarded to us, thank you, Mr. Dennis and Anya, for you guys' support. Uh, what, we, what we decided was that we would, we, now first we had created a system, a nonprofit organization called DOORS, which was responsible for unifying all of these bodies. And I was simply there to encourage them, to create their contracts, and to monitor their success. And when we got the Second Chance Act grants, they said, whoa, this is way too much responsibility for us. And many nonprofits were not following their lead because they were so new themselves. And so when you're trying to introduce people to criminogenics and LSCMIs and all of these areas where they started a nonprofit for the passion, they didn't start it for evidence-based practices. And so to introduce them to that area, it really took a soft touch. And this organization, I guess, wasn't soft enough. And so they decided to give the money back about a month or two before the Second Chance Act conference. And so that meant that the commercial banker and her new boss had to decide what will our programs look like. And so what we did was we took this money uh, and this opportunity to say we want to make sure that we are looking at a much bigger picture here. We have a whole system to change in Dallas. It's not just about oh, starting two new programs just to show DOJ that we can be successful. It's really about looking at how are we looking at the unique needs of, unique needs of each of these individuals. Are the nonprofits in Dallas really giving excellent case management? Are we really uh, assessing these people to know what their risks are? Does anyone in Dallas know what it means to be high risk or moderate risk or low risk? Do we care? Are the correctional facilities talking to the nonprofits in the community? And the answer to most of those questions was no. 
which re was the result of us having such high recidivism rates and which was the reason for us having such a disfragmented system that really wasn't getting much grant money from across the country. We were probably receiving one of the lowest amounts of grants than any ma major city. In fact, four years ago, we probably wouldn't have even applied for Second Chance Act because it wasn't an area of priority for our city council and for others in our area. However, we've had great leadership who knew that, look, if we want to be able to spend more money on education, if we want to spend it on beautifying and convincing people that Dallas is just as exciting as New York and Chicago, uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're getting there, uh, despite the Super Bowl weather and All-Star Weekend. But, uh, but if we wanted to be able to use those funds in other areas, they finally came to them and, aha, we, always have high costs in incarceration as well as in education, in educating and incarcerating youth. And so that made it a priority for them. And so we created two programs and a Dallas Reentry Council with our two Second Chance Act grants. And so today we'll only focus on the family base and I'll be very quick because uh, I want to share a little bit about our IMOM model and then I'm going to hand over the mic to Stacy Burns who is my subcontractor. And so the city decided that we would only keep 20%, roughly 20% of the funding that we received and put the other 80% back out on the streets with our nonprofit organizations and then educate them in the areas of the evidence-based practices that we'd learned in DC, as well as of the models that we've seen to be successful and uh, then be able to support them. So if we never get funded again, we will at least know that we have really increased the capacity of our nonprofits who these clients are going to see every day and we can know that we have a much stronger chance of reducing our recidivism and we've at least left a long lasting impact. And so one of the programs we created was IMOM, Inspired Mothers Overcoming Mountains. Yeah, see I've been speaking and not switching. Now IMOM, Originally, the focus on IMOM was going to be families. And when we, um, whether it were men or women in the criminal justice system who had families, we wanted to be able to focus on them. And when we spoke with our county, the county said, yeah, the only population we'll support you in working with is our pregnant women. And so I've been pregnant a couple of times, and I know that I was no fun to deal with. And so uh, I can only imagine if I had a substance abuse problem and a few pieces of information in my head that I needed to get out, I'd, we didn't think it'd be a very fun ride. And so we resisted, but we didn't have a choice. And so uh, as we jumped into the IMA program, what we learned was that really what's needed, uh, especially for women, is a wraparound model that cradles them. Not, it doesn't baby them, but it cradles them because they are so fragile, just like an egg. Uh, they're, for most of them, their crimes are a result of drug usage, and their drug usage is a result of trying to mask trauma. And because of all of that, when they birth children, they birth those children into their reality, and therefore their reality becomes that child's reality. And so we said, well, we need to make sure that we're focusing on pre-release programming, uh, and so all of our programs, well, excuse me, for all of the areas that we recruit from, it's important that our women are either receiving at minimum 30 to 45 days of pre-release programming through our county jail, or they're receiving the minimum of six months of intensive substance abuse services and cognitive behavioral services at our Wilmer Judicial Treatment Center. We found that recruiting straight from our county jail was not working because of the fact that many of the, we have had such a high increase in women being incarcerated over men in our county jail that our commissioners have found every way possible to uh, get those women out as quickly as possible. So while some cities may have county jails that hold women for their entire sentence, we were seeing that these women were not being held for the 30 days. They were being held for two weeks or they were being sent on to a, um, to a more uh, maximum facility sooner simply to reduce costs in the county. Uh, unbeknownst to them, eventually they'll see those exact same women come right back. And so it made it hard for a program that requires pre-release to continue to focus on simply on the jail. So we expanded to include our Wilmer Judicial Treatment Center where everyone is, uh, stays there for six months and receives the cognitive behavioral, they receive family reunification, families are invited to come there and spend time with the, uh, with the clients as well as they receive the milkman curriculum and, uh, they, and they, are probation, they receive probation in 
into uh, what we call STAT court, Successful Treatment Through Aftercare Collaboration. And Judge Mays, who oversees that court, she's kind of like Judge Judy, where she, uh, she will put you on blast and then she'll show you love, just like a mother should. And so these women are really in a court that's not just about the gavel, but that's really there to give them the support they need. And so uh, we provide transitional planning, con cognitive behavioral therapy, education and employment services. Of course, we use the LSCMI to do a risk needs assessment. And then our case manager, who uh, works for Nex Nexus directly, is responsible for making sure that she's case managing their unique criminogenic needs. And we have family reunification efforts, as well as a data collection software called Empowered Case Management that we use to be able to completely assess every woman in every area, whether it's the services she receives, the reality of her family, her criminal history, all of those areas are able to be captured in one web-based software so that the city of Dallas is able to see that client, any other service providers that are a part of her life and also have access to ECM can case manage her based on real-time efforts and services. Not to mention, if she's receiving bus passes or food vouchers from one organization, we're able to know that before those same funds are spent on that same woman by another organization. So it helped us to be a lot smarter with our resources. And uh, I'll show you our collaborative partners. As you'll see, every area of the criminal justice system in Dallas is on this list. And when we say collaborative partners, we don't mean that they've, they've signed an MOU or that they said, yeah, we know you're out there. These are agencies who have committed manpower, who uh, on a weekly basis, we have at least 50 of their staff members that are dedicated to helping us serve our clients and are in court with our clients or make sentencing decisions based on our relationships and the information that that we bring to the table as well. And we found that to be incredibly uh, instrumental. And so we've taken at least 20 people over the last six months to San Francisco, uh, to, as well as to Washington, D.C. recently to speak before the Federal Interagency Reentry Council. Mainly in San Francisco, we were there to look at all of the fabulous work they're doing with women, as well as Sunny Schwartz and their, their resource center, the programs they have in their jails, uh, as well as to look at the work that's being done at Delancey Street, as well as with children through Project What and other organizations. And so we've created the Children of Prisoners Task Force that includes our school district, our sheriff's department, the public defender's office, and all of the partners that you'll see on the next two pages, they're uh, part of our or, um, Dallas Reentry Council. And what that did for us by traveling and seeing it being done, it took it from concept to reality and everyone came back on fire. Our sheriff was on fire to be able to come back and implement this. Our PD's office and our DA's office, they came back really ready to work and partner with us. And so our target population is, are women, expectant mothers or women with children under 10, diagnosed with substance abuse problems, incarcerated in our county jail or our judicial treatment center, who've received a minimum of 30 days of pre-release services, and we only work with those who are moderate to high risk of recidivism uh, according to their LSCMI. And we provide, as I mentioned, pre-release services, residential outpatient, treat, res residential as well as outpatient treatment through our partners, post-release case management, legal advocacy. We will go to court with a woman for CPS cases or uh, even for her own case and say we don't think she should go to the state penitentiary. We believe she should come into our program. Uh, family reunification, child care, gender-specific cognitive behavioral therapy such as seeking safety and post-release case management. And now I'll let, take, turn it over to Stacy. Hello, I think we're, we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna kinda go through this quickly. That's okay. You said 10 minutes? I knew Eric could, could take up the She's time, I told you that. That's a, so I kinda, I'm not gonna go through every little point on each slide, but but going to talk a little bit um, about gender-specific treatment. Um, I think it's obvious men and women are different in many ways. We know that. But unfortunately, we haven't designed treatment around that. And I think Maureen kind of alluded to that, even in corrections, that um, you know, studies, research, and understanding addiction, even, even the brain and addiction, have mainly been done around men. And so treatment was designed around that information. And so it's only been 
Um, probably the last 10 years that we've really made a huge shift in gender-specific treatment and actually treating women based on what they need and what works for women. Um, it's important to know that women get addicted for different reasons. Um, that, that's important in treating them, but it's important in understanding relapse triggers because what gets women addicted is also what gets women back to it, and so that's important. Um, you know, wanting to, to, to belong, to feel accepted, that kind of thing. Um, losing weight, no surprise, you know, we serve a lot of women, well, majority of our women are stimulant users. Um, stress and boredom, improved mood, that kind of thing. Those, those are all things that are important to know about women. Uh, women do progress faster in their addiction um, for different reasons. Our brains are different. Our hormones are different. There, there are reasons for that. Um, for women, shame is a huge part of their addiction. And I'm going to talk in the next couple slides about why that's important. Um, we recover differently and we relapse differently. And you need to know that if you treat women in substance abuse. Traditionally, there's been a lot of barriers to treatment. I'm fortunate enough to work in a treatment center that's been in existence for 41 years in Dallas that's female specific. Not a lot of them. There's also not a lot of programs that allow women to have children there or take pregnant women, that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's been a big barrier is having children. Not having children can be a barrier because that's a motivation for treatment for women. Um, Poverty is a big issue among women. Um, their role being central to the family, you can't leave. I mean, who's going to take care of everything if, if you're not here? Um, at work, tend to be less managers and CEOs and that type of thing or women so they can hide easier. Um, missing work can be blamed on the kids. Uh, that works a lot easier for women. Um, there are a lot of parental motivations for treatment, and, and if you work with women, um, use that. Use, use the kids to help motivate them. It works. Um, people think, that, I think people that don't understand addiction have quite, you know, how could you do this to your kids? How could, how could this happen? You, you don't love your kids, that kind of thing. It's not about that. It's about they have an illness. They have an illness um, like other illnesses. And so um, there are a lot of motivations because they do love their kids. They do want to be a good parent to their kids. So you can use that. Pregnancy is a huge motivation for getting women into treatment. Um, they, you know, although there's a lot of fear about if I go into treatment, my baby will be taken away. And so that's a, where we have to really work closely with Child Protective Services on allowing women to keep their kids in treatment. There's a lot of stigma around being an addict as a female. Um, I, I think more than, than for men, a lot of it tied to being moms. How, you know, how, how could someone do that as a mom? Yet we don't say how could they do that as a dad. It, you just don't hear the same kind of thing. You don't hear the same kind of just, um, derogatory words used about men as women that, that use and are high and do things when they're high that are inappropriate. Um, pregnant, like I said, a lot of stigma for pregnant substance abusers, but uh, the fact is the addiction does not stop when they become pregnant. Um, in fact, sometimes it gets worse because then there's so much fear and they don't know how to deal with fear or cope with their feelings, but to you. So it actually kind of makes it worse sometimes. Areas of focus that are important in treatment if you're treating women, um, obviously low self-esteem is a big issue for women. Some of it, you know, related to uh, trauma, but related to the stigma, that kind of thing really affects women. Um, grief, um, a lot of the women coming into treatment you know, because we also have an adult program where they don't have their kids with them, and often that's because they've been taken. Um, and if you're a parent that has your kids, you, you can only imagine what it would be like to have your kids taken from you. It's like taking a limb, or it would be for me. I mean, it, it would be horrible. And so there's a lot of grief around that, and they medicate that grief. They may act like, oh yeah, you know, I've had my kids removed and like it's no big deal. That's because it's so deep down and buried, the shame of that and the tremendous loss that they can't deal with it. 
um, they are often involved in unhealthy relationships. We have a number of women that leave treatment because of the man that's on the outside. And so um, that's something that's something that we, we struggle with a lot is is the attachment to, to an unhealthy relationship. They become real isolated, hiding their addiction, and so, so they don't have a lot of support systems. Uh, mental health is a big issue. Um, we're becoming more and more aware of co-occurring disorders. That's a big part in substance abuse. Um, years ago, there were treatment centers that wouldn't even take clients on psychotropic medications. Uh, we still run into that some in Dallas and housing, which is, is a mystery to me to not want to take a client, you know, some of our clients on psychotropic medications, because I'm thinking that if they come off their medications and you take them, I think you're going to be in a worse position than if you took them on their medication. That, that, but there's just still some stigma even around mental illness. Um, so it's important that you're treating both. If you have a client or, or, or a woman in treatment that has both, you need to treat them. It needs to be integrated because they, be, they need to be stabilized, both of those. Other areas of focus, obviously parenting, if you, if you have a women and children's program or if you don't have a women and children's program. Since so many of these women have children, they still need parenting education. They need to learn about um, child development. They need to learn about how to balance their recovery and parenting that it's not an either or. They've got to know how to be able to do both and do both well to meet the needs, their needs and their kids' needs. Um, having kids in treatment is, is a great preventive um, opportunity for the kids because you're really able to plant some seeds with these kids that hopefully um, can create some resiliency in them, reduce their um, involvement in criminal activity, involvement in alcohol and drugs, those kind of things, so that's important. Um, because relationships are so important to women, that's something that's really important in treatment. Um, their relationships with us as staff um, that care about them, that genuinely want the best for them, that's important, and they know it, if, if it's there or not. Um, it, it's, it's good to involve family uh, you know, they're close to their family, get their family as the support, even though their family's tired of them and worn out, we need to get them involved because they need to be part of their support system to stay clean. Trauma, it's been touched on by Maureen, but we've come so far in that area as well, understanding the impact of trauma on individuals, but in particular in women, and that, um, that if, if if you don't focus on that and don't understand that about the woman, you're really kind of missing the boat in treatment and the opportunity. Um, many women have been abused by people they know, love, and trusted. It's a huge violation that really, um, it's such a violation of trust, particularly when it happens at a young age. So it's no wonder that women um, that, that, that I work with don't have a sense of honor about their body that have been involved in prostitution. I mean, they were violated. It's not precious because it was taken from them, particularly when it was taken by someone that they loved and trusted, the people that was supposed to protect them and treat them like a, their little angel. I mean, when that's taken, it really, it really goes to the core of someone. Um, females have longer periods of trauma, more frequent trauma, childhood, and, and as has been said, and then it goes into adolescent, then it goes into adulthood with rape, domestic violence, that kind of thing. Be aware that um, symptoms of trauma can get worse with abstinence because they can't, they can't mask the, the feelings with drugs and alcohol. They can't treat those, those feelings. So you need to be aware of that, particularly if a woman's entering only at the outpatient level, um, you need to be aware of, of the trauma issues that are really going to come up when the drugs are taken away and, the, and it's a significant relapse risk. It's important to do a, a trauma assessment, really understand someone's background and to train the staff on the impact of trauma and how that impacts their behavior. We label behavior and treatment sometimes incorrectly because we don't understand in the impact of trauma and what it does. I mean, you've lived sort of in that uh, flight or fight or flight response for so long, you do have a lot of anxiety. You are more edgy. 
you do respond differently. And if you don't understand that, then the way you respond to that is inappropriate to that woman. So you really need to, to, do, to understand that. Um, Trauma-informed care, these are kind of things that are real important to this. You find it in different curriculums, safety, um, sense of trust, choice, collaboration, empowerment. Um, early treatment goals, when you're working with women involved, that have experienced trauma, is to establish safety. They've not had that. Your environment needs to feel safe. They need to feel safe in your hands. Uh, it's important to them. And then, of course, an early recovery is how to, how to not use, but, but it's about the feeling. What do you do with all these feelings when all you know is to get high, to escape them? And these are just some of the, uh, the resources um, that I've used in our talk. Now, we, we actually use the Seeking Safety um, curriculum at Nexus, which, which is really good. It's a present-focused model. Um, some of our women are not in treatment long based on, on state funding and, and issues like that. Um, but, but it's a good um, curriculum for trauma survivors. Teaches a lot about safety, grounding techniques, um, ways to deal with trauma without, um, and anxiety and those kind of things with, with, without using. And so that would be one if you don't use it to, to look into. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Was anyone in the trauma workshop yesterday? Okay, so you've heard this already. I won't be offended if you walk out the door. <laughs> um, let's see. I was uh, the last of three speakers in that workshop yesterday. It started at 4 and ended at 5.30. <gasps> and I said to everybody I was the only person keeping them from the bar. Right now, I feel like I'm the only person keeping you from your break. Okay, from beginning, here we go. Okay, my name is Lisa Fries, and I'll try not to move around too much, but I'm, I have a hard time just standing. Um, I'm with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. That's a real mouthful. Um, I'm a consultant there, and I am the project leader or director for our reentry project for girls, which is a second chance uh, demonstration project that we were awarded in 2010. Um, our program is targeted to serve 84 girls from the ages of 13 to 18 who are coming out of residential treatment, um, having been adjudicated delinquent for, for any type of offense, but known to have issues related to trauma. Um, the reason we decided to do what we did, what, you know, our intent was to, to really try to address uh, the, uh, the issues that um, girls face when they're coming out of placement that um, may trigger uh, trauma-related um, relapses and manifest themselves as delinquent, which would obviously re uh, make them return to the system. So um, that was the, the real intent of the project. Um, as you can see, we did not get a lot of money. Um, we did not apply for a lot of money. Uh, 183000 is not a lot of money if you're, if you're in the service provider field. Um, but what, the reason we requested what we did was we knew that we were going to have a difficult time uh, crea creating the match that was required with the, with the money. So the first thing we did actually was request a waiver on the cash match to have all of our match be in kind. So I'll speak a little bit later about some of the, the partners that we have um, on our project and, and how we're attempting to get their time uh, accumulated as our in kind match. Um, PCCD does not provide the treatment for these girls. We have a subcontractor. Unfortunately, we don't have her with us today or, or the project director for that. Uh, but the Children's Home of York was the provider that was selected through a competitive solicitation process. Um, as you can see, our project uh, timeline is 2012. We were awarded this grant in September of 2010. Um, we had uh, an issue last year as we were um, looking for a subcontractor 
contractor to provide this service, we entered into discussions with a uh, service provider and uh, spent a lot of time actually trying to get them prepared to, to uh, handle this project when they withdrew right when we were getting ready to get started and decided that you know they just couldn't do it with that amount of money. So we went back to the competitive process, which is why it took us so long to get our, get our program started. So we started in January of this year, so I can't really speak to any outcomes or anything right now. Um, but um, let's talk about why we chose the girls from where we chose. All of our girls are from the five southeastern Pennsylvania counties, Philadelphia and the four surrounding counties. Um, what we found was when we were uh, developing this idea back in 2009, we looked at placement data for girls uh, in 2008, and we found that 46% of the girls that are, were entering placement were coming from those, those five counties. And it, even more sadly was that the almost half of them were also coming back into the system for a second or a third time. So we decided to focus our demonstration project solely on that area. Um, and as I said, we were looking to provide services to 84 girls. Um, if you know anything about juvenile work or um, uh, uh, girls, I guess specifically, you'll know that you'll, you've probably heard of the MacArthur Foundation. They had a Models for Change initiative back 2004 is when it started, and we were one of the first states involved in that project. Part of that was our aftercare um, initiative was one of the three targeted areas that we looked at for the funding that we received from them. Um, we thought it was important to continue to concentrate our efforts on re-entry, and uh, therefore that's why we decided to apply for the Second Chance Funds. It just kind of made sense, because at that same time, we were also looking at uh, gender responsive services for girls because we felt that that was definitely an area that we were deficient in as a system within Pennsylvania. We have, and Katie, tell me if I'm running over because I was a little longer yesterday, but we have five um, counties, like I said, that are participating right now. Our intent, hopefully, is if we find the outcomes prove that the program is successful, is to rep replicate this statewide. Um, but we also have seven residential pro uh, partners. I didn't talk about um, when the, the services actually begin, but we have two therapists from the Children's Home of York that start uh, developing a relationship with each of the girls uh, w while they're still in the residential facilities. We typically try to identify maybe three months out from when they're due to be discharged that, um, th that they begin the referral process, determine whether or not the girl's appropriate for the program, and then uh, uh, start developing that relationship. So the therapists are, are traveling to seven different residential facilities, seeing these girls, developing those relationships so that they can provide that seamless transition and therapy once the girls are released to the community. Um, it's a real challenge, and, I, and I'll talk about these a little bit later, but it's a real challenge with the amount of money that we have to be able to pro uh, provide uh, enough funds to have these therapists traveling all over the place. Um, Pennsylvania is very rich in service providers, so we really had to kind of focus on, on providers that are, are closer to that southeastern part of the state. Um, you heard some of my colleagues talk quite a bit about uh, collaboration and um, partnerships, and that is really, I would say, the, um, the crux of our project. It, this would not work if we did not have that collaboration. So what we had to do as part of the solicitation uh, as a demonstration project is create an overseeing body or an oversight body, which is our reentry task force. Um, the reentry task force is made up, we have about 24 members um, on our, our task force currently, and it consists of state and local government agencies, nonprofit providers, community stakeholders, all of our partners involved in the project, the residential facilities, the juvenile court personnel that are making the referrals to the program, and of course, Children's Home of York and their therapists. We have met one time thus far during the 12 month project, we anticipate probably having three to four meetings. So we have our, actually our second meeting next week and we're gonna discuss some of the challenges that we're facing right now with respect to uh, 
the in-kind match, how the girls are doing. The therapists are going to talk about the therapy they've been providing thus far. Um, so I'm looking forward to that meeting. But our initial meeting back in January was a really good meeting because we all came together. Uh, Children's Home of York presented what they wanted to do with their girls and um, the girls that were referred. And uh, the task force was really good for providing feedback um, related to, to the uh, type of therapy they're providing, which I forgot to mention was trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, um, we, we do have a number of chal challenges that we're facing. The amount of funds uh, is probably going to run out rather quickly uh, in terms of the, the traveling. We've added two facilities. We originally started with five, but we had to add two because we found Philadelphia was using two additional programs uh, with some frequency that, that uh, had girls that um, were identified to have trauma-related issues. The match funds, as I said to you, we literally have people completing timesheets. Anybody that's involved in the project is completing timesheets in the hopes of capturing that in-kind match. Uh, that's, that, that's probably the biggest uh, challenge that I've faced thus far. The number of girls, we initially uh, targeted 84 girls to provide services to. Um, the, the services are, you typically go three to six months post-placement. The girls have to uh, voluntarily commit to being involved in the project, as do the, you know, the, the families, because they're involved as well. But we told um, federal OGJDP that we could provide services to 84 girls. Well, what happened was, since the data that I talked about in 2008, we are four years later, and placements have dropped significantly in Pennsylvania. Uh, we don't have nearly the number of kids in placement that we had previously, and um, that obviously is a concern that we're not going to be able to, to, to reach our target. Um, the girls that we have right now that we're dealing with, I think we have one or two that's actually in the community right now, most of which are still uh, in placement, um, and we're at 21 right now. So we're five months into the project and have seven months to go and 40 plus, or what am I saying, 60 plus girls, 60 or so girls to still provide service to. The other issue that we're dealing with is sustainability. It's a one-year project. We are looking to hopefully have our program continue, provided the outcomes, again, are successful. Um, through the Department of Public Welfare, the counties in Pennsylvania, we're a county-run system, they actually submit what's called a needs-based budget. I don't know if any other states do that. But through the needs-based budgeting process, we're hoping to have our program approved so that we can sustain the program in Children's Home of York or whomever the provider or providers would be, would be able to, to bill through the, the counties would be able to bill through the needs-based budget to pay for the service. That's, um, that's a challenge right now because we are um, now, the counties are now applying for their, their budgets for 2013, which starts July of next year. So we have about six months of uh, gap in funding that we need to identify and hopefully find, uh, find some funding for um, to continue this service because a lot of the girls that are going to come into the program in the fall aren't going to um, make it through entirely um, by January. So um, one of the other things I wanted to mention to you real brief briefly is with our outcomes, as I said, we just started, so we don't have um, any outcomes to share with you today. But one thing we're hoping to do is to, to have our girls, um, we'll provide them with incentives to come back and uh, participate in focus groups. And um, also, hopefully, if we can identify girls that did not, that were not part of the program uh, through our juvenile probation partners, we're hoping to uh, have another focus group of girls who did not participate and try to compare the two. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, hopefully we'll show good outcomes. This is my information. Um, I have some of the brochures for the program. If you're interested, feel free to come up and grab one. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. So hopefully what you all have gotten out of the panel today, you know, we sort of started with a review of the evidence-based practices and kind of talking about um, what are some things that you all can be doing in your programs to increase your outcomes and get some additional effect.
reproductive outcomes. And we talked about the clinical piece and how treating women is different from men, as well as some program examples that you all heard in different ways that um, the grantees are using some of the funds to work with women, as well as working with girls and sort of as um, program staff, how you make these decisions for the type of services you're gonna offer for girls and how you're gonna implement those services and where you're really gonna concentrate those scarce resources that we know everybody um, is experiencing right now. So I think with that, first, I, I know Maureen did this in the beginning, but I would love for, if you're working with girls, can you raise your hand? Okay, great. Girl. Girl. Women. So let's say as you, right? Yeah, you. And so how many do we have here working with? Okay, great. And then the rest are working with adult women. Wonderful. And so how many of you have, you know, not being specific, but just a challenge that you're experiencing implementing your Second Chance Act grants throughout your program? Really, everyone else? <laughs> All right, well, I would love to open it up to see if anybody has any questions, maybe about some of those challenges that you're experiencing or any questions at all in terms of what the presenters here today were speaking about. I think one of the challenges within the, within the system, I'm from Kentucky, um, is the distance that families have between the loved one incarcerated and where they are, especially because women's facilities are fewer in our state, from Eastern Kentucky to where the two women's prisons are, could be seven or eight hour drive. So what happens also then with reentry? Uh, if anybody here has experience working with women who are returning to a rural setting, perhaps a setting where you might identify the culture is different. Absolutely. Than city, than city cultures, if, you, if you, anybody could speak to that and, and how you've accommodated that. I think Warden Hansberg, if you want to, I know Decatur is somewhat of a rural area. Well, well, Decatur itself is not necessarily, but for example, the men's population, about 70% of the men come from Cook and the Collar Counties. But it's different in the women's division. Um, with women, you have 30% that are coming from the Chicagoland area and 40% that are coming from the rest of the state. So 30% from central Illinois and then 40% from down south. And so what actually happens is you, we are constantly looking for options that will be able to assist these women. And the only way that we can do that is to work with our placement resource unit. Um, that is one of the visions of our department, to seek out resources that are in those areas, um, and especially the closest resources that are possible. The communities are going to have to assist in some way. There's no way that we can do it alone. We have to be able to reach out to the communities and find out what's available out there people can no longer say well it doesn't affect me because it does affect all of us how many people keep returning to the um, to our facilities and to incarceration and so that's the best advice that I can give we do have the well I'll say luxury luxury in times of diminishing staff um, but um, we do have a unit that actually assists with placement of those women. But in order for your organization to really, really be able to do that, you have to go to those communities and reach out for assistance. We are a community resource, and the Department of Corrections- Is so far. I can tell you, right. The, yeah. the, the, the idea of uh, communicating and sharing the information mm -hmm. that, that they that we would like to see. Right, absolutely. You have to do something to really try and, um, I don't want to say mend those fences, but somehow be able to work better together. Because if you work better together, then of course that assists with the, um, de the recidivism rate decreasing. And so really, that's really going to be the key, just continuing to determine what types of opportunities and how you can better communicate with that department. And Katie, I'd, I'd love to add, that's really one of the challenges, even though we're right in the heart of downtown Dallas, and so, you know, we don't have the rural issue. However, we do have a challenge with getting um, 
being able to have that connection between the child and the mother where they can actually touch each other, see each other face to face, mm -hmm. because our sheriff uh, has a big problem with children being in the jail at all. Mm -hmm. And so um, I took her very much on purpose to San Francisco with us on our last trip just to see all of the work that their sheriff's department is doing in allowing these women to have connection with their children uh, as well as just in the in jail programming the level to which they go and so we had dinner one night and I said well sheriff you know we've got to have we have to find a solution because these children have to be able to have some sense of maternal connection and she said well you say Erica you know I really have a problem with these children being frisked or being patted down, she said, because, you know, we've seen children smuggle drugs in their pockets or in their hair, you know, just as easily as an adult, and I don't want the officers to feel as uncomfortable with patting down a child. It's not a good experience for anyone, at least in our jail, because there aren't, we don't have the beautiful settings where children can go like they have in Decatur, unfortunately, and with women not being there for very long uh, recently, then it's just become a, yeah, it's really a transitional facility, exactly. So we compromise on a Skyping project. And so, uh, and so we have a lot of re legal ramifications to work out and, you know, and getting the caregivers to be okay with the situation and monitoring it all. But we decided that what we can do, and our school district has agreed to it, um, the parent and our case managers or our subcontractors will be able to um, be present in a Skyping session with the child who will either be at home with that caregiver or in the counselor's office in their school. And so mom can either read a story, they can talk about the child's favorite superhero, whatever they want to talk about that's, you know, in line with what will be appropriate for a child or for the level of the relationship they have, uh, but that may be a solution. I'm not sure what type of techn technological capacities your criminal justice system has or, or the correctional facilities, but that may be a way for you to connect mom and child if that distance is a reality for you. And, and just one other thing to that, we do participate in video visitation, so that assists us. But for our facility, the host is in Chicago, so it really doesn't help those downstate areas. But the department itself has embarked upon video visitation for the for the full department. And right now we have some pilots in those areas that are um, very hard to travel to. So our Dwight Correctional Center, it's easier than, but that's our maximum facility where women tend to lose touch with their families because they're there for so long. Um, also in our male division, um, Menard Correctional Center and Tams Correctional Center, which is our closed capacity, those all have video visitation and the department itself is working on opening that up for all of our facilities because we do realize, just like Illinois, you could be at the most northwestern tip of Illinois and then go all the way to the southern tip, Tams, and it's going to take eight and a half hours to get there. I know, I've had to do it in a day. So I totally understand that. But working with your departments, your your local municipality, well, not municipality, but your county to try and do something like those types of projects, and you may be the impetus to get that started. And actually, Stacey, I'm wondering, this is something that we didn't get to touch on as much during this presentation, but if you wanted to add a little bit about some of the strategies that you all have to make it um, easier for women to visit your facility, like the child care and that sort of thing. What, right, we are a community-based treatment center, but we run our own licensed daycare on site um, and do some things in our daycare with the kids. We do a lot of, of course, parenting kind of things, do um, parent-child labs, um, where where they're sort of like a group, but not really. Um, but it, activities with moms and kids and kind of teaching moms how to interact with their kids appropriately. It's often the roles have been reversed and the, the, the children have been taking care of the mom and their addiction. And um, we do homework labs, you know, teaching moms how to sit down and do homework when kids come home from school. I mean, some things that they're not used to in developing routines. We have a family bonding time at night that's mandatory that they're doing. Um, learning that, you know, routine and structure is real important and really impacts children's behavior, can actually keep them calmer. Um, so we, we do some things like that, but our child care center really um, offers a lot of services uh, for the kids through community resources, bringing those in and providing care to the kids because we're not really funded for treatment for the children, so we use our, our resources in the community that do that kind of thing to come on site and work with our kids. 
I just want to mention, we have a baby dorm and a maximum security facility. Wow. So that's amazing. Wow. Much Where like are yours. You? Indiana Women's Prison. Yes, I actually yes. visited there. Okay. I did. And and I, I, that's where we, I went, to, what part of Indiana are you? Since was Indianapolis. Yep. You started in 08 and we started mm -hmm. in, I mean, you started in 09? 07. 07. Okay, we started in 08. Mm -hmm. so, so it's actually a year after. Right. I just wanted to respond to the rural question. One of the things we've been lucky in I see is that, that we're able to go around the country and work with different jurisdictions. We work with urban jurisdictions, but also rural jurisdictions. And um, we've done, been doing a lot of work in Iowa, which is a very rural state. And um, if, if you emailed me, I would be very happy to give you some contacts there. Some folks have really had to be creative about creating community-based resources. Um, Maine, we've done a lot of work with as well. So, yeah, you really do have to put on your thinking cap to be creative and energized. Stacy, just one quick question. What TTSD assessment tool would you recommend? We actually use a screening tool. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head, but if you give me your card, I I'll, I'll get it when I get back and, and email it to you. Okay. But, but we use a, a screening tool. I mean, we use a state um, assessment, a system that's kind of mandated by our state, and, and so and it really doesn't address trauma in the way. So we, we do um, a screening. It, it's a screening tool, but it really, it's. Is ACE? I don't think so. I don't know off the top of my head. We looked at a lot of different ones, kind of determine what, we don't, we didn't want to, because in our our women's program, our women children is so short, 14 days. We didn't want something that like was so extensive that it opened people up too much. So we opted more for that's a little more of a screening assessment instead of very very detailed information, because that can that can tr trigger some of the women. You just mentioned the ACE. Uh -huh. Are you referring to the adverse childhood experiences? I think that, I don't think that's the one I'm not It's the one that's recommended by, yes, is that it? Yeah. It's the one that's recommended by the, um, Cheryl Sharp with the trauma informed group. It, if folks aren't familiar with the ACE yeah. study, um, Adverse Childhood Experiential yeah, right. Studies, it, it's a fascinating um, bit of work that was done between 95 and 97 on 17,000 um, folks like us who had who worked and had access to health insurance, and they carved out 10 areas that if you experience them as children under the age of 18, they were indicators of um, health and well-being um, as adults. So it was a link between child maltreatment to health and well-being as adults. And so this was in the general population. And then when you take that and you apply it to a criminal justice population, which they've done, they did a study in California in the women's prison, it was, the results were just phenomenal about the link between women's experiences and what happens to them as adults. We've seen that with the veterans as well. Um, I'm from Minnesota, and we have uh, been implementing the second chance grant for the second year. And uh, just one question that my supervisors asked me to kind of pass around. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any um, ideas on how to sustain the second chance grant? Oh, I know that that is a huge challenge. Um, unfortunately, there's obviously no easy answer. Otherwise, everybody would be receiving the money and the programs would go on forever. Um, one of the things that we've heard, and I know several of our panelists have mentioned, is that having firm partnerships and collaboration throughout a wide variety of agencies has helped tremendously. I can tell you that there are programs that have really succeeded in the sustainability piece and all of them have done so because when the money went away, all of the agencies and partnerships that they've created along the way um, kicked in time, they kicked in money when this went away because everybody saw and was convinced as to how important the work was and so they had, uh, they had a stake in it and they felt very passionate about it and didn't want to see that once the funding went away, the programs were gone. So I think a really important part of sustainability and important part for all of these programs and knowing, of course, everyone in this room, um, you may be working 
on their first year grant, second year, may have already had one, have a different second chance at grant. I think it's really important as you're moving forward to really think about those partnerships and how you can how you can really foster those and use the grant as part of that. And I should mention too that um, your technical assistance providers that, that you all are connected with can assist with those kinds of conversations as well. So if there's a group that you think is um, particularly important to have in the conversation that isn't now that would help you lead to sustainability, we have some resources at the National Rancher Resource Center that can help with that, some people that can help with those conversations with groups that you maybe want to engage but are having a difficult time doing that you think will really affect your sustainability in the long run. So, you know, if as you're going through the conference, I would suggest definitely asking other grantees that question, you know, keep asking that and seeing what other people are coming up with. But I would say again that the, the theme we've heard throughout are that the partnerships are really important to, um, to have in place and that will help with sustainability. And if I could just add yes, real please. quickly, outcomes. Show, yes. that your pro <laughs> show that your program is effective. Mm -hmm. That's the second piece of this. Yeah. You know, you, once you have the partnerships Absolutely. in place, Try, you know, collect your data, show that your part, your program's successful, it sells itself, hopefully. Collecting data is so very important because you need to evaluate it from the beginning all the way to the end. And many times we'll always think that the evaluation part comes after. The evaluation actually starts when you begin to even develop your program. So you gotta continually do that. all are up on a break right now and, and hopefully if you oh, have some time and want to come ask some questions I'm sure everyone here would be willing to stay in chat so thank you again for being here we really appreciate it